This is video 8 in our um, series, Topics in Tensor Analysis. Um, in this video, we want to talk about reciprocal basis vectors. Um, before we do that, we'll probably have to split this video up into two parts. But um, before we get on with our topic of reciprocal basis vectors, let's just kind of highlight what we did in the previous video, where we had a um, generalized curvilinear coordinate system with coordinate axes u1, u2, and u3. And then we had these at the point p for each coordinate axis, we had a tangential vector. The e1 being tangent to the u1, e2, and e3 being uh, tangent to their respective coordinate system. And notice our labeling pattern. The um, coordinate axes are labeled upstairs, and these tangential vectors have subscripts on them. And what we did was just very straightforward. We said, well, here we have a vector A in this curvilinear system, and we could express the vector A the way you typically do. Find out what its component is along the U2 coordinate axis, along the u1 coordinate axis, and along the u3 coordinate axis, and then add them together. And that is what this is right here. e1 is, a ten, is tangential to the u1 axis. Now this is not a unit vector, so this is going to have some magnitude. So the projection of a onto here is going to be something times the magnitude of that tangent vector. And likewise, this would be the projection of vector A on the U2 axis, and this would be the projection of vector A on the uh, E3 axis. And these components here along the tangent axis we labeled with a superscript. And the way that um, we found in the previous video these tangential vectors was Here's a Cartesian coordinate system with its unit vectors. And here's the position vector. And we can express it in terms of the Cartesian coordinates. Then if we take the partial of this with respect to u1, it gives us e1. If we take the partial of this with respect to u2, it gives us e2. And again, those details we worked out in the previous video, the general expression was this. Well, this right here then is really the basic definition um, of a contravariant vector, where we have the components along each particular coordinate axis, but they're labeled with superscripts. And what we found was that if we do it, oh, and by the way, a reminder that the playlist for all the videos is at the website, digital-university.org. Now, if we label our components like this with these superscripts, then what we showed in the last video is if we have, this is our U coordinate system, U1, U2, U3, u4, u5, u6, and so forth. This is a different curvilinear coordinate system. u prime 1, u prime 2, u prime 3, u prime 4, and so forth. Now here's vector a. So here is vector a expressed in the u coordinate system. e1, e2, e3, and we'd also have tangential vectors for these other axes as well. All right, if we then express vector A in this system. In the new curvilinear coordinate system, which we are designating just with the primed axis, then what we found in the last video was it transforms like this. Here's a component of vector A in this system here. By a component, we mean with a particular uh, projected onto a certain coordinate axis. If we know what that is in the U system, or let's just say in our unprimed system, then in the prime system, the component can be found 
by doing this, taking these partial derivatives and summing over this repeated index. And this is exactly what we did in the very first video, where we had two different curvilinear systems. We labeled them X and we labeled them Y. And then what we discovered is that when we had a displacement vector in the x-coordinate system, and we knew what its components were, its components in the y-coordinate system could be found by taking these partial derivatives and summing over this repeated index. And then we generalized from a displacement vector to a vector in general, where here we have the components of it in the x-coordinate system, then the new component in the y-coordinate system could be found by taking these partial derivatives and summing over this repeated index. And that is exactly what we end up doing here. So the point is that the basic definition for the contravariant components of a vector is you have the vector in a particular coordinate system and then all we do is, what we typically do, is we take the orthogonal projection of this onto each axis and then add up all the components. And that is a contravariant vector. That's a vector with uh, contravariant components to it. Now, we ended up the last video with this diagram. Here we have u1 u2, u3, a u-coordinate system, and here is a vector a, and let's just concern ourselves with the u2 and the u5 coordinates. Then we could express vector a with its components on the u2 projected onto the u2 axis and its components projected onto the u5 axis. Now, we said, well, suppose that for here, instead of having a tangential vector, E2, and for here, instead of constructing a tangential vector, E5, what would happen if we had our U2 axis and we had a vector that was orthogonal to it? And here, for U5, we likewise had a vector that was orthogonal to it, instead of being tangential to it. Well. For our vector A, if we wanted to, we could then take the components of it along this orthogonal axis and along this orthogonal axis and add them up, and that would be a different expression for the vector A. And as it turns out, that is the covariant components of the vector. And how exactly how all that plays out, that's what we want to discuss in this video and the uh, next video, and that involves the concept of uh, reciprocal basis. Now, before we do that, let's go back. And in some of the previous videos, we made specific reference to spherical coordinates, which are a type of curvilinear coordinate system, where the coordinates are the angle theta, the angle psi, and the magnitude of the position vector. Now, for here, we can find out what the tangential vectors are in each case for theta, psi, and r just by following the general formula, taking the partial of r with respect to ui. Now, for our spherical coordinates, We know how they transform. We know if we know theta, psi, and the magnitude of the, of the position vector, we can determine all the Cartesian coordinates. Or conversely, if we know the Cartesian coordinates, we can determine what the spherical coordinates are. So what that means then is that our position vector r, instead of writing it with x1, x2, and x3, we can write it like this. 
this is x1, that's x2, and that's x3. Now, if we take the partial derivative of r with respect to small r, small r being the magnitude here of the position vector, take that derivative, well, the r goes away, the r goes away, the r goes away, and we have this expression right here, which has a magnitude of 1. So if we take the partial of r with respect to r and divide it by its magnitude, which is just 1, it gives us this unit vector, er, where this, then, is tangential to the position vector. And we can do the same thing for theta. Take this kind of derivative, the partial of r with respect to theta, and we're not going to go through the details of this because it's worked out um, in almost all the uh, standard textbooks, but take the partial of this with respect to theta, that will give us a new vector, divide that expression by the magnitude of that new vector, and it gives us this. And this is the tangential vector for theta, the unit tangential vector for theta. And we can do the same thing for psi. Take the partial of r with respect to psi, gives us a new kind of vector, divide that by the magnitude of that vector, and it gives us this unit vector. So here we have the unit vectors, er, e psi, and e theta. We can see here that theta goes in a down direction like this. r would just go like this and then psi kind of points in this direction. Now we note then we didn't put the um, hat marks on these but these are unit vectors. Notice now that if we go to a different position in space, say out here, the direction of these unit vectors changes. Clearly er would be pointing out in this direction, e theta would be pointing almost like down in this direction, and e psi would be pointing in a different direction. So for these unit vectors of our spherical coordinates, they change in direction as we go to different points in, in uh, along the uh, space curve here. Also, if we take the dot product of these with each other, of any one of these, er, e theta, and e psi, take those dot products, it comes out equal to zero. So that means that for spherical coordinates, all these are orthogonal to each other. Now, when we're discussing curvilinear systems in general, we are not assuming that all these coordinates are orthogonal to each other. In fact, we're assuming that they are not orthogonal to each other. Okay, now, with that basic discussion, what we want to do is shift gears and talk about reciprocal basis. Now let's just go back. Here we have this generalized curvilinear system with u1, u2, u3, and here we have the Cartesian coordinates. And the position vector r we write like this. Now we're assuming that we know how to transform from the u coordinate system to the x-coordinate system, just like we did with spherical coordinates. So that any Cartesian coordinate is going to be some function of these curvilinear coordinates. Just like here, any Cartesian coordinate was some function of the spherical coordinates. And likewise, any spherical coordinate that's going to be some function of the Cartesian coordinates, just as we saw here specifically for these spherical coordinates. So that means then that we can write 
the position vector r, here it is, realizing that x1, x2, and x3, we can write these then as functions of the curvilinear coordinates and vice versa. So that means then that the position vector r, we can write it like this. And we actually went through all this in a previous video. Now, we can take the partial of this with respect to any one of these curvilinear coordinates. Take the partial of r with respect to ui. And that would be equal then to the partial of x1 with respect to ui plus the partial of x2 with respect to ui plus the partial of x3 with respect to ui. And again, we can take these partial derivatives because we can express x as a function of these curvilinear coordinates. So taking these partial derivatives is no problem, and that's what we discussed um, a couple of videos ago. Okay, and then when we do that, that gives us the tangential vector. EI. So, so far we haven't done anything um, new in this video, but now we want to do something different. What we want to do now is, for each one of the curved linear coordinates, either U1, U2, or U3, we want to take the gradient of that. Now remember, um, back in, I think it was video number two, we discussed the gradient vector. And then we wrote it in this form like this. The gradient of some scalar is equal to, and here we, we had just a simple two-dimensional system, x1 and x2. And we said, for a scalar that's a function of x1 or x2, its gradient would be the partial of it with respect to x1 times the unit vector on the x1 axis, plus the partial of the gradient with respect to x2, times the unit vector on the x2 axis. Now here, let's just follow then that same formula. Try to keep things in better focus. Okay, here we have then the gradient for uj. Following that same formula, that would be the partial of uj, with respect to x1, now we write the unit vector like this, plus the partial of uj with respect to x2, and we write the unit vector like this, plus the partial of uj with respect to x3, and we write the unit vector like this. Okay, that would be the general expression for the gradient of uj. Um, exactly what does it mean? And I think that we're going to come up on a time limit here. So what we're going to do in the second part of the video, we're going to start with this general formula and show more specifically what it means, then after that demonstrate the consequences of that meaning. So come back, join us for the second part of the video. We're going to round off our discussion um, concerning reciprocal bases and then how that applies to covariant components of vectors and tensors. So come back. Join us for that video, and we'll continue on here with our discussion.